So are you guys ready to learn something new? The speaker who just came up, where's Bob? Bob, you couldn't have planned a better segue for me. He, one of his last bullets was, was try new things. Our industry is really ripe for new ideas and new strategies, that's for sure. And if you've been in this business for a while, you've probably been running plays out of the same playbook for many, many years. And I'm here to bring you some new ideas, some new ways of thinking. Uh, if some of you are on social media, there's something going around lately. It has a picture of a, of a tennis shoe, an athletic shoe, and it asks you to, what color you see. Has anybody seen this? So it tells you if you're a left brain person or a right brain person by looking at this shoe. Well, I'm, I already knew I was a left brain person, so I didn't need this confirmation, but it certainly does confirm. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you today is left brain stuff, highly analytical, very strategic. What we're not going to talk about today is sniffing and swirling and sampling and tasting wine. We're not going to talk about overcoming objections and recognizing buying signs. We're not going to talk about the importance of putting together a great presentation. In fact, I hate presentations and you'll, you'll see that. We're going to talk about how to sharpen the focus of your sales activity to the most attractive and responsive accounts. I'm going to give you ideas that will help you bring a new strategy that will allow you to cut through all this competitive clutter that uh, the speakers have been talking about all day. So um, I'm five years in to my consulting practice. And uh, what I do is work with small family wineries and craft distilleries and a few big wineries and, and uh, distilleries along the way. But my main focus is helping them get better results with their sales efforts. Is there anybody in the room that's not interested in getting better sales results. Okay, well, I, ho I, hope, I hope that you are. Now, distributors and importers aren't typically my audience when I speak, but that's okay. Uh, mostly I'm speaking to winery owners and distributor, distillery owners, et cetera, but this is gonna be relevant and I tried to tailor uh, this talk for the audience. And I'm definitely leaving time at the end for questions. I'm the last speaker, so I'll stay here for as long as you want to, to uh, answer any questions you might have. So if I don't show you any other, well, actually, the next slide is the money slide. So this is the goals of the session. I need you to recognize and accept that times have changed. Bob talked about this. Times have changed. But, you know, you say that to people in our industry, and especially people that have been in the industry for a long time, you know what they're thinking in their head? Ah, that's not, what's changed? It's pretty straightforward. You got the three-tier system. You got these wines. You got buyers. What you know? What's really changed? Well, I'll tell you. A lot has changed. So much so that if you're still doing things the same way you did five or six years ago, you're going to get left behind in a hurry. So the good news for people who are just entering the market is if you just forget about all the things that used to go on and just pay attention to the climate now, you can make a very big difference. So I want to get you to recognize and accept that times have changed. Now I don't know how many people in the room. Uh, far less than there were 10 minutes ago, but I guarantee that there's at least 10% of you that will not accept this, that will not believe what I have to say. You're going to cling to your deeply held beliefs, and that's okay. That's just how the world works. It doesn't bother me. But, if, but my mission today is to get you to open your mind to some new things. That's the point number two. Get you to open your mind about new things. And I'm going to show you them. I'm not just going to talk theory. I'm going to show you and then give you strategies that you can start using tomorrow. In fact, depending on which coast you're on, you can probably start using them this afternoon. So here's the agenda. How has our industry changed? And it has changed a lot. And some of the slides you just saw. Uh, how has selling changed? Selling has changed so much. And yet I see people every day selling the same way that they've always done. Uh, we're going to bust some myths. I have uh, trifocals, so reading this thing is incredibly difficult. Maybe I should just turn around. Anyway, if it looks like I've got some kind of dyslexia, it's because I can't read that thing. It's so tiny. Next time, can we get the adult version of that monitor? Uh, where was I? Selling exchange. Three, bust some myths and deeply held beliefs. This is my favorite part. Here's where we will really part company. Some of you are going to get on board and say, well, that's really interesting. Nobody's ever showed me that. Other are going to think I'm just smoking crack. Uh, keys to accelerating Salesforce performance. And let me tell you something. Here's a hint. It's not what you think. It is not what you think, the key to accelerating sales performance. 
If you've never read any of my blog posts, I publish quite a bit on my website, SalisburyCreative.com. Some of the most popular blog posts I've written have titles like, Why Knowledge is Important, but Not Nearly as Important as You Think. The most popular blog post I ever wrote was Stop Depending So Much on Your Distributors. Went completely viral. Over 5,000 people read it, liked it, and commented on it. it. The keys to accelerating Salesforce performance, in fact, if the fire alarm goes off and you have to run out of the building, this is the most important thing I have to say today. The key to accelerating sales is to narrow the focus of your selling activity to only the most attractive and responsive accounts. You want to double your sales? Ignore most customers. And I'm going to pro prove it out to you. Really sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? I know the crack smoking comments are going to commence. How has our industry changed? Well, uh, Bob just showed you we're using different slides with different sources, but the message is exactly the same as what Bob just showed you. This one comes from Silicon Valley Bank, and it's, it's a few years older than the one that Bob showed. But here's the problem. There are just so few distributors today and so many more wineries and spirits brands. It's just not the same environment. And so you can't possibly approach you, the selling of your products and the distribution of your products in the same way. You must make adjustments. And that's, what, that's kind of the essence of my talk today. Uh, just two weeks ago, this quote came out from uh, the head of sales or the CEO of the uh, Jackson family, CEO. He, he said there's 125,000 wine brands in the U.S. And I believe him. Because if you take the 10,000 domestic wineries, which have many brands within the brands, and then all of the uh, wines from all over the world, I mean, on the other side of that curtain, and some of you may have booze over there, are just a tiny speck of the people who want into this market. The uh, Wines Australia is spending $50 million to, imp to increase distribution around the world, primarily China and the US. So this is not going to improve, it's only going to get worse. So uh, that's one of the things that's changed. Let's look at the spirit side. You know, the spirits have a little bit easier because there's not quite so many products, not quite so many SKUs. But what the spirits people are up against are some super, super big budgets on the spirit side. But, you know, there's what, uh, over 1,800 craft distilleries, more coming. I saw this quote out of ADI that says, 360 new distilleries coming this year, 2019. So. The, this is what's changed. Now, let's, let's illustrate this. Let me tell you what this means to you. I took this information directly out of 750. Uh, this is for Texas only. I'm not picking an RDC. I have no ax to grind. It's just a great example of what you could be up against. In the state of Texas, RDC, according to 750, has 2,000 suppliers. 2,000 suppliers. I, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they keep all those people happy. And 34,000 wine brands. Now, if you're a small brand or a new brand, guess where you are on this chart? I've facilitated this by putting a giant blue arrow on the chart. That's where you are. What do you think the odds are of getting any kind of attention? Now, you could say, well, Ben, that's, that's R&DC and, you know, Southern Glade. We get that. We get that we, a small brand is going to have a hard time and large distributor. Well, this same model, I don't know if I have another slide of this. No, I don't. Sorry, let me go. Can I go back one slide? Where's my control dudes? Can I go back a slide? Okay, forget it. I can't go back. Uh, I was, the point I was trying to make is that you, your chances of getting the distributor to do something for you are, are very slim. And distributors, if there's distributors in the room, I feel your pain. I mean, one of the reasons why my blog post stopped depending so much on distributors went so viral is distributors really ate it up. They, I got notes from them saying, you're saying stuff to our supplier community that we're not comfortable saying. We can't just come up to our suppliers and say, you know, your preparation sucks. I don't ever see you in the market. How can you expect us to do everything for you? The best we can do is match your efforts. So if you don't have any efforts in our market, then why are you expecting us? They can't say that and they won't say that. But, but, I, but I have said it. So what can you do to adapt, right? What can you do to adapt? If you're still among the group that doesn't believe me that this is a real problem and it's a new problem, this problem didn't exist 10 years ago, 12 years ago. 
You could do a lot of things with the distributor. Spend time with the distributor. Do sales meetings. Do work with. Do in-market blitz. Run contests. Spend incentives. Those things worked. But guess what? They don't work anymore. You've got to bring something else. You have to bring something new to the equation. And you have to have realistic expectations. I can't tell you how many people, and I don't know anyone on the other side of that black curtain, so I'm free to say this. I don't mean to offend anybody, but a lot of the people on the other side of that curtain have it in their brain that if I can just find the right importer and I can find the right distributor, I'm well on my way to building this brand. I'm going to have new distribution, new sources of revenue. This is the fantasy, but that's all it is, is a fantasy. Unless you're committing resources to whatever market you go into, your own people, or at least the ability to create demand in the trade through your Facebook advertising and your, your email marketing, you're really going to struggle. So you've got to adjust your expectations. The good news is once you've adjusted your expectations, you can then get to work on the new playbook. I have a blog post called, I forget the exact name of it, but it's basically introducing the modern sales playbook for wine and spirits. I told you what the old playbook is. Spend time with the distributor, educate the distributor, incentivize the distributor, motivate the distributor. That's the old playbook, used to work, doesn't. So what's in the new playbook? And the new playbook is you're going to have to generate demand in the trade yourself, either with your own people or using social media. And there's a whole realm of using Facebook advertising aimed at the trade to collect email addresses. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you must look into this. Just, you know, the whole showing of the hands thing is very unreliable. It's especially unreliable at 3.15 in the afternoon, but I'm gonna risk it. How many of you raise your hand if you know of and currently use the Facebook pixel in your trade outreach? One, two, anyone else? Three? Okay, well, we need, it needs to be a much higher percentage than that. The fa and I won't have time to get into it today, but the Facebook pixel is an example of a, of a modern tool, because this is my topic right here, modern selling, in case you missed the, uh, the, the booklet. The Facebook pixel is one of these modern tools. Now, have you ever gone to uh, somebody's website? Maybe you're on Google. Maybe you're doing some kind of shopping. You're uh, searching for like a new pool sweeper or something. Um, and then next thing you know, your Facebook feed has got all these advertisements for pool sweepers. Do you ever see that? That's the Facebook pixel. If someone from the trade visits your website, you have the ability to capture who that person is. And you don't know their identity, but Facebook does. And you can market to that person. If you're monitoring your website traffic and you're aiming your advertising at the trade and as people visit your landing pages and your website, it's being captured, this is game-changing stuff. But guess what? The vast majority of people in our industry, they don't even know about it, let alone using it. That's just one example of how you can begin to implement modern stuff. But the most impactful things are the things I'm about to show you. But this burden, the point number two is the burden of building distribution is shifting from the distributor to, to the supplier, to the producer, to the maker, to the manufacturer of the product. Accept this reality or don't. But I promise you this is what's happening and you must be able to adapt. Look, there's four things that brand owners must do really well. And if you're a distributor or an importer in this room, this is a good slide for you because it's a polite way to tell the suppliers that are coming to you with all these unrealistic expectations. This is a great uh, talking point. First of all, stop depending so much into distributors. Let me be clear. I am not saying don't use distributors. I'm not saying don't expect anything from distributors. I'm saying stop depending so much on distributors. You've got to balance it with a lot of your own activity and your own investment. You've got to measure the right things. I'm going to get into this in a second. You have to leverage 80-20 in everything you do. Everywhere I go, uh, whenever I do a survey on this, 60, 70% of the people in the room believe that the 80-20 rule is nothing more than a clever marketing theory, that it's not real. It doesn't work in the real world. Well, I promise you it's real. It's real for every consumer product category. It's true for every price tier in the wine business. It's true for sake. It's true for wines from Bulgaria. It's true for everything. It's true for every market. And it's especially true with how you spend your time and investment. And the fourth thing is hold your salespeople accountable for results. I'm going to end my talk today by, by talking about CRM. Because if you can't depend too much on the distributor and you want to employ some of these new modern strategies, you must leverage technology. 
You must take every available technology that will help you sell more product and improve the quality of your distribution, and you must leverage it to the hilt. So today I'm going to show you what some of that is. Are you with me so far? So let's just pause to talk about how selling has changed, because this is really kind of a pet peeve of mine. Selling is not about persuasion. Selling is not about products and product attributes. Now that's really hard to get in your head if you are the owner of a product that has nice attributes. As a little experiment, earlier today, before it got too crowded, I walked through the expo out there, and I would stop at tables at random. And I would say to the people behind the table, what's so unique about your wines? What is so distinctive about what it is you're selling? And guess what nine out of, well, nine out of nine, guess what they did? They started talking about the attributes of the product. They didn't answer my question at all. They just wanted me to taste the product, taste the product, here's my product. One guy talked about how long his family had been growing the grapes, and I just wanted to say, no effing deal. Everybody has that story. That isn't distinct. Wine's six, seven hundred years old. It's not, in, it's, you're not even getting up to the plate of how long your family's been growing grapes. Nobody cares. Anyway, I'm spitting. You know that I'm getting very passionate when I start to spit. I'm glad I'm the last speaker because I see little glistening drops on this thing. Anyway, selling has changed. It's not about the product. It's not about presentation. It's about bringing real business value to the relationship. That's been mentioned several times today. How will your wine help me satisfy my customers? How will your wine help me reduce my inventory? How do I know that if I agree to use your wine, you're going to ship it at the correct price? How do I know that if I get a, build a following for this wine in my restaurant, that you're not going to run out of stock? Now, not very sexy, is it, to talk about supply and price consistency and service and dependability? Not very sexy at all. In fact, that's part of the problem for the wine and spirits business. What attracts people to our industry is the sexy stuff. You know, I have the palate of a wolf, and I have nothing against people who can achieve WSET, one, two, three, however many levels there are. I could never do that. I, I, I'm just not smart enough. My memory sucks. But, it, but the good news is, it's not really what's, what I don't think. That's really what's going to make a big difference in this competitive environment. All that stuff is great, and I have my hats off to people who have those gifts and have worked really, really hard to achieve those certifications. My hat's off. My big message to you, though, is it is, in today's environment, it is nowhere, nowhere near enough. So let's take a quick look. How is selling changed? Just real quick. The internet. You know, buyers can look stuff up. They don't need you to get on a plane or drive, take a bus or a train, drive all the way to their office, park, go into their office, and sit there talking about the product. They could have looked all that up. In fact, not only are they looking stuff up about your products, they're looking stuff up about you. And you know what? So I could really go off on a big tangent here, but I'll, I'll resist the temptation. You don't have an updated... LinkedIn is not just for people out of jobs. LinkedIn is the primary source by which buyers are looking at sellers. It's the primary source they're looking to know who, what's going on. Do they, are these people on the ball? They're also looking at the same thing on social media. They go to your Facebook page, your Instagram, and they haven't seen a post in six weeks, or they see a bunch of people have responded to one of your posts, but nobody from your company has responded to them. You forget about how good your product is or how sharp your presentation is. The modern environment has moved way beyond that. So you, you cannot come to the table with that kind of game. Millennials in the workforce, not just selling, but buying. Social proof. I, I'm, I'm sorry if all the people today mentioned scores, the importance of scores. I, I don't I mean any disrespect to these speakers, but I am not in that camp. I don't believe that today scores are nearly as important as they used to be. If you get a good one, then leverage it to the hilt, maximize it, tell everyone, use it, that's fine. But you can't depend on that. You better have a better plan. Uh, CRM, which I'll talk about last. The death of the structured sales call. Uh, warm up, presentation, overcoming objections, closing and asking for the buyer. A relic from the 50s. Uh, the shift from a product-based features and benefits selling to business acumen and adding real business value. Now, though, we're not going to be able to get into all that today. What I want to do today is to get you to walk out of here thinking, you know what? He might be onto something. We don't do any of those things. We're very focused on the product features and benefits. In fact, all of our selling materials and all of our training is focused on getting our salespeople to be more educated about the products. You need to have that. It's important, but it's not enough. And then empathy trumps persuasion. If you're a reader, 
and readers are leaders, okay? So if you're not a reader, you might want to start. But there's a book uh, called To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. I recommend it as recommended reading for anyone who wants to get with the modern way of selling, where he talks about this idea of empathy and really understanding what the people you're trying to sell to are up against and how you can help them. And not even necessarily products, just you personally. But reading modern books on selling, like Daniel Pink, is a great way to, to join the modern era. So let's bust a few myths, my favorite part. How are we doing on time? Not too bad. Uh, let's bust some myths, okay? And here's a quote from JFK, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, it's the persistent persuasive myth. That's free, by the way, free, free quotes from JFK, I don't charge extra for that. So here's some myths. Now here's where we're gonna really part company, okay? So if some of you feel the urge to just like get up and leave and protest, I won't take it personally, happens every time I speak, okay? So just feel free, act like you got a phone call and just start walking away, it's fine. More sales calls equals more sales. Bullshit. Are we recording this? Can you bleep that out? Is it possible that more sales calls could lead to more sales? Yes, of course, because the opposite is also true. No sales calls equals no sales. But, I, but, but the emphasis, the, the, the key to selling more is to make more sales calls is preposterous. If whatever you measure, you'll get more of. You want to get more sales calls? Measure the number of sales calls that people are making. You want to make more sales? Then measure the number of sales. This is a myth, and it's a trap, and it has dangerous consequences for people who put too much emphasis on this. Look, I'm starting to spit again. More customers equals more sales. This is really not true. It is absolutely not true. More of the right customers equals more sales, and this was mentioned several times in the presentations today. And I'm gonna go into this more customers does not equal more sales things much more deeply in a second. More, my favorite, more product knowledge. Uh, I was, last summer, I was the keynote speaker at the Wine Industry Technology Symposium. And I was really riled up, I had a lot of espresso, and I just felt like, what do I have to lose? So I just really led into this topic and I had a picture of a, of a sommelier with his nose in a glass, and I talked about how our industry tends to revere wine knowledge above business acumen. Nothing wrong with wine knowledge, it's just that it isn't the be-all and end-all. And I talked, I used that picture of a, of a guy, a tuxedoed guy with a tossed van and his nose in a glass, and my hat's off to that, our industry, those are the rock stars of the industry. But if that's one of your salespeople, you might wanna have a, have a talk because more product knowledge, while important, is not enough. It's just not enough. We've got to balance that with solid business acumen, which I'm about to roll into. <laughs> Another myth, the presentation is key. Uh, if you've never read Mastering the Complex Sale by Jeff Toole, T-H-U-L-L, -L, I highly recommend this book. He talks about something called the presentation trap. He says, presentations suffer from three fundamental flaws. Presented way too early in the sales process, too much information, and to the wrong person. Now, I think if you look deeply at what you do and maybe what some of the people who work for you do, the presentation is held up as the be-all and end-all, the holy grail of selling, and it's really not. And again, I wish we could dive into each of these, but we won't. Uh, and the last myth is that people can be motivated to sell. Just more complete BS, okay? People if you want motivated salespeople, then hire motivated people. If you want to sell a lot of, you want your salespeople selling a lot of product, then hire salespeople who sell a lot whether, whether somebody tells them to or not. Uh, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole playlist about how to hire uh, talented salespeople, and I go into this topic very deeply. But as someone who has hired and trained more than 30 salespeople for the wine and spirits industry, I promise you, no amount of training or motivation is gonna change somebody. In fact, as proof of this, the highest performing salespeople that have ever worked for me on any given day had no clue where they stood on their bonus plan. And some of these bonuses were 25, 30% of their annual salary. And most of these guys' base salary was six figures. So they were talking about a lot of money. They had no clue where they stood on their bonus program. Do you know why? Because great salespeople who consistently achieve results Ironically, they're not motivated by money. You know what motivates them? Pleasing their customers, winning, you know, doing, doing well. 
it's just such a myth, the carrot and the stick. Anyway, I, I don't have time to get into it, but I promise you, these are myths. Don't take my word for it. Dig into it a little more seriously. Here's a life-changing book. Since you're now uh, among the, the avid readers of the world, the four-hour work week really changed my life. And if you're in a sales role, a sales leadership role, you really need to read this book. Oh, there's a lot of stuff in there you may or may not use, but the primary upshot of the book is that most things don't matter. That if you have to be very disciplined in the use of your time and not allow yourself to spend time on low value activities. So let's dive right in that. Less is more. This is a modern way of looking at sales. Very, very counterintuitive, very controversial. If you're in the more is more camp, uh, you're gonna just suffer more and more because the, the tables are turned against you. So let's dive into this. The 80-20 rule is real. I'm about to prove it to you. Don't take my word for it. Take your own data. Test it. It's absolutely true. Now, sometimes it's 21-79. Sometimes it's 30-70. The idea is the same, that most business comes from a few number of customers. You know, 80% uh, of the traffic that's moving around Manhattan right now is on 20% of the roads. Uh, the 80-20 rule works for everything. And let me show you what it looks like in our industry. So this is taken right out of a book called, and I love the title of this book. I love it when the title of a book matches what you want out of the book, right? The Complete Guide to Accelerating Sales Force Performance. Wow, I can't get my money out of the, my wallet fast enough. This is a great book. It's actually a textbook from the Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern. When I read this and implemented this, it absolutely transformed my, my professional sales life, and here I am sharing it with you. So here's the first truth. The business is always concentrated. The business is always concentrated in the top 20 or 30% of the account base. It's that way for everything, okay? But here's the problem. Without a disciplined, strategic approach, we often let our salespeople spread their time a little more democratically. And here's what it looks like when you overlay typical effort. There's a typical allocation of effort. Because the thinking is, if there's a restaurant or wine shop out there that doesn't have my wine, I must go sell to them. I, 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 you know, anyone who's not using my product is my customer. This is not a smart way to think. You can't be everywhere. Time and money and people are your most limited and precious assets. You must be more strategic. The smart way to accelerate sales is to ignore the bottom third of the account base, take all the time, money, and energy that you used to spend and shift it over to the other side. If you do this and you use a modern uh, tool like CRM to keep track of all of this, you will dramatically accelerate your sales. And to sweeten the pot a little bit more, there's something called the 80, 20, 30 rule, which is if you spend any time in the bottom one third of the account base, you're guaranteed to cut your potential in half. Just let that sink in for a second. Because this is, what, this is why I hate the, the uh, metric account sold. And you know, account sold is just a very hollow metric. It assumes that all accounts are created equal and they most certainly are not. You must discriminate. You must ignore the bottom third. You must ignore the low value. Stay away from them because as you can see on this chart, you get diminishing returns on that end of the spectrum. So I realize this is very controversial stuff and very unsexy, right? You guys feeling like, oh, I'm so glad I joined the wine business. This is sexy stuff. Looking at the 80-20 rule. If I'd only known, I would have joined the wine business earlier. I'm sorry, but the wine business isn't as fun as it used to be unless you're, you're selling everything that you make and the spirits business. So let's just look at a couple real life examples. In the state of Texas, we're able to access how much taxes restaurants pay for liquor, beer, and wine. So I went in and I pulled out the gross receipts for spirits on the top 2,000 accounts in Texas. Does that the shape of that graph look familiar? Yes, the business is concentrated. Let's take a look at, uh, so here, 26% of all accounts. So now this is, this is the, fi the top 5,000 accounts. 26% of all the accounts drive 80% of the business. So any time spent in the bottom tail end of this account base, you're, you're, you're wasting your time. You're never going to achieve your goals. Uh, same thing with sales in the top 100 American whiskeys. The business is concentrated. 
this is, comes out of my life as an on-premise uh, chain VP. <laughs> 20, the top 20 chains do half of all the business. 20 chains, half of all the business. I was really able to accelerate our sales at St. Michelle Wine Estates by ignoring uh, 40 or 50 chains and just, just stop calling on them, put all that time and energy into the top 20 and it had a dramatic effect on the business. But 21% of the chains do 80% of the business. Uh, here's retail accounts in the state of Massachusetts. Same, the, the chart looks exactly the same. Uh, here's the 500 distributor sales reps in the US. It's the same. Uh, one time I was working with one of my clients and uh, I was going over the, uh, the strategies for each of the people on the sales team and the woman who was managing this one state said, one of my goals is to get to know all the sales reps. This year I want to get to know all the sales reps of the distributor. And I said, that's a huge mistake. Get to know the top five or six that are selling the most of your wine and find one or two that should be selling the most that are not. And that's where you live because you, you're, you'll get a much bigger bang for your buck. So leveraging the 80-20 rule, there's lots of ways to do it. We, get it, we, have this, we have this confusion where we think lots of sales, you know, it, it, it feels good, right? Lots of sales, lots of activity, lots of sales calls. I have this saying that if show me a salesperson who's sweating and harried and I'll show you a salesperson who has no strategic plan. They're, they've sold out to the god of activity. They think that activity is what the game is about. It is not. Activity is only useful if it yields results. And in our industry right now, you can't afford to allow activity to be the primary thing you're after. So given the fact that the 80-20 rule is true every time and in all cases, then how can you adapt? You can start putting this stuff into place right away. First of all, stop treating all accounts as if they had the same value. They do not. Accounts sold is a terrible metric. A better metric is where are the accounts that are doing most of the business? How are we, what's our distribution like in those accounts? Because if I can get a, a wine by the glass placement that yields five cases a week, how, why would I bother chasing all this business where they buy once or twice and maybe even never again? You must be able to measure the one and done accounts. You have to have a system to measure the people who bought one time and never again. This is why I hate sales blitzes. I have a, uh, and maybe, maybe you're a distributor in the room and you hate them too, but you're not allowed to tell anyone. You couldn't ever utter those words that you hate sales blitzes, uh, but I can. Uh, I have a blog post called The Pointless Futility of a Wine Market Blitz. You should check it out, forward it to all your supplier friends. And I put the word friends in parentheses. Anyway, account sold, it's not a great measurement. Identify the 20% and restrict your activity to them. You'll see a dramatic increase in your selling. And as much as possible, avoid low value activities. You should have a not to do list. You should have a stop doing list. Because of the degree you stop doing certain things, you're gonna have a, a dramatic lift in your, in your sales. Other ways to apply 80-20? And, and honestly, okay, modern selling. What do you mean by modern selling? I don't get that, it means nothing to me. This is a big part of it. This is a big part of it. You gotta be more strategic in the use of your time. You have to be more strategic in the use of your money. There's lots of things you could do with your time and your money and your people and investment. But the good is the enemy of the great. You already know that. I didn't say that, I don't know who did, but it's absolutely true. You must be more strategic. You have to step back and analyze the market opportunities and narrow the focus. At the top of this talk, I said, if you only get one thing from this, this speech, it's this. The key to accelerating Salesforce performance is to narrow the focus of your activity to only the most attractive and responsive accounts. How are you gonna do that? That's what you need to figure out. But it will be a game changer, an absolute game changer. Time, markets, spending, uh, spending money, and dealing with problems. Uh, these, are the, these are the key ways to leverage 80-20. So I'm gonna ra wrap up with a couple of things that uh, if your head's not already full, this will certainly finish the job. Leveraging data, technology, and the best practices. Sorry, not very sexy. I'm not gonna stand up here and rattle off the cruise of Beaujolais. I'm not gonna tell you why grower champagne is so great. Don't really give a shit. I'm, sure, I'm sorry, but this is how you're gonna make, make a difference in your, in your selling. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with the modern tech tools for the wine and spirits industry, you might want to start looking, uh, looking it up and researching them. Start with these. These are all CRM providers. How, how many of you know what CRM is and are using it in your sales process now? Okay, good. But if you look around, why isn't everyone's hand up? It's 2019. You, I don't know how you're keeping track of all your activities if, unless you're using a cloud-based, mobile-friendly CRM. I, I don't know how you do it. You're either doing it in an Excel spreadsheet or worse, on a legal pad, or maybe some people use their email inbox as their file filing system. It is, you know, our industry is not the most cutting edge. I get that. But this is something that's within your control. Someone earlier today, I think it was Eric, talked about the things that are within your control and the things that are without your control. This is certainly, leveraging technology and data is well within your control. I realize it's not very sexy. So this is, this is a slide you can read later. You're, you're gonna get a copy of all these slides. I just want to help you make this distinction that reporting and analytics isn't CRM, okay? I ask a lot of people, hey, what, are you using CRM? They're like, oh yeah. Well, what CRM system do you? Oh, we use Trade Pulse. Or, or we use, uh, you know, uh, BDN or we use VIP. I'm like, well, those, that's not CRM. Those are reporting and analytics tools. Oh, well, we get all of our CRM from the distributor. You know, we use their report. I'm, that's not CRM. CRM is the things on the right. You know, the, the tracking attributes of specific accounts. Like, let's say that you uh, s make a very high-end wine. Something that wholesales for 40, 50 bucks a bottle. Wouldn't it be nice to know all the restaurants in any particular market that used, that had a Corvin by the glass program. Like a whole section of their wine list where they're pouring more expensive wines using Corvin. Wouldn't that be a great list to have? Well, once you get that list, you can designate it that way in your CRM, and now you can track all activity investment against that specific list. You can make all these sub lists of targets according to what it is you're trying to sell. What if you had a list of all the restaurants in your city that poured expensive champagnes by the glass? You could, in your CRM system, since that's an attribute of an account, they pour expensive champagne by the glass, you can track that. This is a, just, just a, a few examples of some very specific things. One of the things that I like to keep track of in my CRM is which, which restaurants have outdoor seating? Because I will tell you, restaurants with outdoor seating do three, four times the, vi the wine volume and spirits volume than restaurants that don't. And private dining is a game changer. Restaurants that have significant private dining space do 10 times the wine volume of an average restaurant. If you had a list of all the restaurants in your city that not only that had private dining, but how many private dining rooms do they have? What's their total seating capacity for private dining? Those are the kind of things that go into your CRM system. Anyway, just a couple of, couple of examples. Okay. Uh, you'll get this later. This is my recommended reading list. If you haven't read a book on sales in the last 10 years, it's a good time to start. When I talk about modern selling, this is what I'm talking about. You can't be thinking in the old ways if you want to compete today. Okay? Uh, and feel free to follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. I have a YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter. Don't follow me in real life. That would be really creepy. Okay? So, uh, I wanted to save some time for questions. Now, don't you feel bad for the people who left early? Don't you just feel terrible for them? Uh -huh. I do. Okay. Also, I am over here with the mic, and we lost Jeff because he had to go do something else. So, I'm wearing heels. So, just, like, give me a wave, and I will make my way to you. I promise. Questions? Oh, good. Also, sorry for you over there. I will be there next. You spoke a little bit about bringing real business value to the custom, to the um, person you're selling to. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe questions we should be asking or things we should be talking about? That's a great question. And if you didn't hear it, she said, can you elaborate more on this idea of bringing real business value to the relationship? And again, this is not the sexier side of things, but let's talk, let's give two examples. One is a restaurant, okay? If you've ever worked in a restaurant, one of the biggest pains in the neck is running out of product. Why do restaurants run out of product so much? Because they don't have adequate storage space. And so you, you know, if one of the things you can do is if you're, you know, working with a restaurateur and, you, and they're thinking about putting your wine by the glass, you can sweeten the pot a little bit by saying, look, 
here's my cell phone number, here's my home phone number. If you run out of stock, someone will show up with, uh, with uh, more product. I will not let you run out of stock. Furthermore, I'm going to check the distributor's inventory every single day. And if it's not an inventory, I'm going to find out when is it shipped in on order, when is the order due to arrive. I'm going to manage the supply chain for this so you will not run out. Now, let me tell you something. You get something on a banquet list at some restaurant that does a lot of banquets, running out is the absolute kiss of death. You could sell hundreds of cases a month in one of these accounts. And what they want more than anything is that you will, somebody's watching out for the inventory. Another thing is making sure that whatever price you quote, it gets shipped at that price. Do not leave that up to the distributor. That, that they've got a million transactions to handle. They don't, if it ships at the wrong price, they don't, certainly don't mean it, but somebody has to take responsibility for that. So adding real business value to a restaurant is about service, dependability, and trust that you're going to be there to support that placement. You're gonna come back and train their staff. You're gonna do whatever it takes. Now that's bringing real business value. Because let me tell you, restaurants want, every restaurant wants one of three things. Grow revenue, control costs, improve guest satisfaction. How is your product gonna help me grow revenue, control costs, and uh, improve guest satisfaction? Oh, they'll take the lowering of costs, but that's not nearly as important to them as the controlling of the costs. So service, dependability, trust, that's real business value, okay? The fact that you stir your, the leaves of your Chardonnay twice as much as someone else doesn't mean squat in a business environment. There's thousands of Chardonnays they could use. In a retail environment, same thing. Being dependable, being accessible, uh, showing the customer that there is a market for this product. This is why the social media thing is so important. You need to have tens of thousands of real, organically grown fans on your Facebook and Instagram because that is how something you can leverage uh, to the placements you make. That's real business value. Why should I put your Chardonnay in? I'll tell you why. We have 6,000 Instagram followers in this market alone. And if you don't know how to tell where all your followers are geographically, you need to, you need to either change agencies or get somebody in place who does, because all, all that stuff's available. Does that help? Another question, man with the hat, you had a question. So my boss thinks that new points of distribution are kind of what I have to do right now. Uh, I've only been in sales for about five years, but a lot of our business does come from a core group of accounts. How do I talk to him about it without mentioning the 80-20 rule and just kind of telling him, you know, new points of distribution aren't the end all be all? Yeah, that's a great question. And hopefully everyone heard him because he had the mic going. Yeah, so. It's an absolute fact that not all accounts are equal, okay? I don't care who you talk to, what market, not all accounts are equal. So while points of distribution are good, it doesn't mean they're all going to produce. So what you could do is add in a metric or two. So go ahead and measure your points of distribution. That's a great start. Then start measuring retention. How long does the average account that uses our product continue to order it month to month? Start a manner measuring retention. Measure, and also measure velocity. Velocity is sales per point of distribution. So go ahead and let your boss measure distribution and you go get it. But you need to bring in, you need to introduce him to new metrics. Uh, I wanna know the sales per point of distribution and is my sales per point of distribution going up? You must monitor those things. The good news is all these modern tools that I'm talking about allow you to do this very, very easily. You can look it up on your phone. Doesn't, you don't, no special reports or tools required. So all accounts are not equal. I hope that is useful. I think Lauren, there's another question there. And by the way, we're kind of, we're almost, no, I think we're good on time. We got up some time. But if we get over time, I'm happy to hang out and answer any more questions. Yes, hi. Hi, I'm a, from a small to medium sized distributor. So one of my questions is the kind of t touchy point of when you have, like, I'm dealing with an end with a consumer and how to build loyal, they don't, they could care less about Global Wines Maryland. So what is, because, but I do know that long term, what I need to do is to build that consumer's awareness, not only of what my retailers or restaurants are doing, but I'd also like them to be a little mindful of me. Like, what was the last thing you said? Mindful of the distributor relationship. 
You want the consumer to be mindful of the distributor relationship? Well, that's actually my question. If yeah. Well, unfortunately, consumers are, and this is going to sound really bad, okay? But consumers are a lot dumber than you think when it comes to wine. It's amazing the things they don't know. I, I have a client in, what was that? I, I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll get to, uh, let me answer your question. But I do think that there is, lo that if they know that they like this wine and it comes from that person, they're more likely to buy another one. Yeah, I have that, seen I don't that. think that's a realistic, it's too much of a stretch for consumers to somehow latch on to distributor connections. It might happen, but it's very rare. And, but on this topic of whose job is it to build demand among consumers, it is not the distributor's job. It's almost impossible for distributors to do it. But it is the job of the supplier, of the manufacturer, to build demand among consumers. And so when you're, making, when you're having conversations with suppliers, you should have two lists in front of them all the time. These are the things that we're going to take responsibility for and do our level best to achieve. These are the things that we expect you to do and do your level best. So making that connection to consumers is super, super hard for a distributor. Your job is to put the in distribution and put the right products that, that the consumer is going to want when they see it. The supplier's job is to create that demand among consumers. And the good news is it's never been easier or more cost effective than it is right now to build that consumer base. So you sound like someone who really cares about doing the right thing for your customers and your suppliers. And, and yeah, it's just that's a really big leap to, to, to expect to somehow bring the consumers along. Uh, one of my New Zealand clients just spent a fortune on this big study, and uh, they were shocked to learn that the average consumer who's a fan of Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, didn't know that Marlboro and New Zealand were part of the same thing. They, it, it's, it, we, give our, we give consumers too much credit, the average consumer too much credit for what we think they know. Do we have more, more questions? We have time for one more. If one more? Someone has one. And then I'm happy to hang out if anyone has more. No? Good. Also, we are lucky enough to have Ben back with us tomorrow, so he'll be up at the front for a little bit and also around tomorrow if anyone has any questions. Yes, if, it, if you weren't bored enough today, come back tomorrow. I'll bore you for another hour. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. <laughs>